people on TikTok will come up to me in like the airport and be like, hey, you're the black blabbity girl on TikTok. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? Hey everyone, I'm Morgan Debon, a passionate entrepreneur and life advisor. With the Journey Podcast, you'll discover that success isn't about the destination, it's about the journey. I'm sharing stories of amazing people who've taken control of their lives. Join me on my own journey to discover the secret sauce behind reaching success with permission from no one else. Welcome back to another episode of the Journey Podcast. It is I, Morgan Devon, your fabulous, very round host. I'm so excited for this week's episode. We are talking all about brand building, your personal brand, and what that really means in today's society. Because there is just so much noise out here. Uh, a few weeks ago, my good friend Ronnie and I did a podcast episode about building your personal brand. And I would highly recommend that you go and listen to that episode if you haven't. But there was a lot of follow-up questions around how to position your brand for corporate sponsors, how to position your brand for adding more income into your life, and also how to basically perform a brand audit to decide and determine what things you need to change. So we're going to get into those three questions today, and let's get into it. First things first, when I look at people's brands and I think about my own brand, the first question that I ask myself is, what is the purpose of even having a brand? You have to identify the why. If you have an Instagram page or a TikTok page or a LinkedIn page, you might have one because you just like using TikTok and consuming. You might have an Instagram page just because you want to keep up with friends and you want to post really random pictures of your food, your dog, your friends, your vacation, just to keep people updated on your life. Or you have a LinkedIn page because you're a corporate professional and you have to have a LinkedIn page. That is completely fine. Do not feel pressure to make your pages into a business. 90% of the world is just a consumer and that's okay. Okay. So this conversation, if you're like, I'm actually completely fine, not making money for my brand, my brand or page is being private and it not being like a thing that takes up a huge part of my brain or my life. Fantastic. You do not need to listen to this episode. Go about your day. Go about your walk. Have a great day. Goodbye. Okay. For everybody else who stayed, the 10% who stayed, if you're like, I want my LinkedIn page to be something that helps me advance in my career, or I want my Instagram page to be something that adds value to my life, creates opportunities for me, then let's get into it. So the first thing that you need to decide is what category, we're going to focus on Instagram first and TikTok. What category of content and brand do you want to fall in? The three that I think are the most important are entertaining, are you making content that's entertaining? Are you an entertaining person? Two, aspirational. Are you someone who is uh, living a aspirational lifestyle, a lifestyle that's not normal, that is not your everyday, that is more extreme in one way or the other? For example, you are a traveling chef. You live in a van. You are a minimalist. So you only have like seven things in your whole house, right? You live a extraordinary lifestyle in some extreme way. And um, that is potentially aspirational to certain people. And then the last thing is informational. Are you teaching people something through your content, through your existence, through the things that you talk about, through your pictures, through your videos, through your storytelling? Are you providing some sort of value and informational exchange to your community, to the people who follow you? Now, you could mix all three of these if you wanted to. There's funny people who are also informational. There's aspirational people who are also funny. You could. But let's just stick with one for now, okay, and try to do one well. So for me, I consider myself a informational person. I, of course, live an aspirational life to some but for the most part, I'm not posting to show you all the things that I have or the places that I go or the people that I'm with. In fact, I'm showing you the journey along the way, how I got there, the mistakes that I've made, um, the things that I've done right, and the tools, people, places that have helped me along my journey in the hopes that I can have an impact on your life 
and change your perspective on something, help you not have to make the same mistakes that I've made, or accelerate the speed in which you can get to the level or the life that you want to get to. Hopefully, you're like, yes, Morgan, that sounds on brand. Because if it doesn't, then I am doing something wrong. And I would say that if you follow me on Instagram or you follow me on LinkedIn or you follow me on TikTok, you're going to get a different version of me because they're different platforms and they have different audiences. So that's this number two. Once you decide if you're informational, educational, or aspirational, then you have to decide what's your primary platform and where does it make sense for you to build your community, build your audience, build your your tribe. If you're above the age of 25, it's probably LinkedIn or Instagram. If you're under the age of 25, it's probably TikTok. (laughs) Maybe Snapchat, but it's not really a community platform, actually. It's mostly TikTok. Obviously, there's 40-year-olds thriving on TikTok. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying primary audience for youth is TikTok right now. Primary audience for millennials is still Instagram. I'm a millennial, so let's talk about Instagram first. So on Instagram, you have to consider who's on that every single day and why are they on it every single day and at what moment during the day, are they going to interact with your content, right? So if you are a corporate professional giving advice to other corporate professionals, Instagram is great because people are scrolling during their workday and they're stumbling across your content. If you're like a gamer and you're on Instagram, you know, people probably aren't thinking about games in the middle of the day if your audience is also corporate professionals. So you might want to consider you know, when and how you post and how that relates to people and where they are. Um, Now, obviously, the algorithm has changed quite a bit and continues to change, but I still think it's best practice to think about when your audience will consume and in what state of mind they're consuming on that platform. Now, the other thing to consider is if you are talking to an Instagram audience, then I'm probably not talking a lot about things that I would talk about on LinkedIn. So, If I'm on Instagram, I'm talking to consumers. I'm talking to small business owners. I'm talking to influencers, creators. I'm not talking to corporations. There are people listening to this whose personal brand may be a executive coach for executives at big companies or a organizational behavior advisor or private equity mergers and acquisitions advisor for middle stage companies, right? Like those people. Don't even really need an Instagram account. (laughs) You should be on LinkedIn. Now, we'll talk about the marketing managers and brand managers for those corporations and how you reach enterprises through your Instagram and TikTok in a second. But first, I want to just talk to the people who are building personal brands and who your target demo. If your target demo is consumers, it's probably Instagram and TikTok. If your target demographic is businesses, then it's probably LinkedIn. Or corporate professionals, it's probably LinkedIn. After you've decided, I'm an informational person targeting consumers, not businesses. So I'm going to build things on Instagram. And then the question becomes, how do you separate your personal life from your business? And there's kind of two schools of thought. You can create a personal brand that's like your name. That just means that your personal page that has your name on it is a business page. So what you want to refrain from is posting things that are not relevant to your niche. So let's say you are a person who helps young professionals negotiate their first job offer. You're going to be on Instagram giving tips on how to negotiate, what's in a typical contract, how to apply for jobs, all types of good stuff, right? However, when I go to your page, I then shouldn't see like what you ate for breakfast on your feed. Now, in your stories, you can show more of your day-to-day life because that's just like real time. Here's what we're doing today. And you're mixing in your personality. But on your feed, it really needs to be clear and consistent. And I would just follow the typical 80-20% rule. 80% of your content should be in alignment with the industry or consumer that you're trying to reach. 20% should be personality or brand building or just like random stuff to show who you are as a person. Uh, So some of you may be wondering, well... I see a lot of influencers that show every single moment of their life every single day, and that seems to work out for them. And my question for you is, what are those influencers selling? They're probably selling everyday products or selling everyday things, 
right? So yes, if you're a beauty influencer, then yeah, you're going to want to talk all day, every day about everything you're doing, right? If you're a hair influencer, if you're a food influencer, because you're a consumer lifestyle influencer, you're doing things that are tied to lifestyle. And so your lifestyle is the content. It's the thing that people are aspiring to and why they're going to buy your products or follow your advice. If you're a farmer influencer and you're trying to help people learn more about organic farming and homesteads, then also, yeah, I should see you on the farm all day. I wake up on the farm. I'm outside on the farm. I'm making food from the farm. You know, I'm cock-a-doodle-doo on the farm. Like, I'm seeing your whole life. So it is fine to show your behind-the-scenes day-to-day life if that is relevant to the brand that you're trying to build. So really good thing to think through is when you're picking your category, is it something that you want to show all day? So for me, I don't consider myself a lifestyle influencer. I'm not sitting, showing you guys all the products, everything I eat, everything I wear. I'm not doing affiliate links building. So I'm not linking out to all the things that I am putting on a picture or putting in a video at all. What I do link out to is the books that I read, the podcasts that I listen to, uh, the people that I recommend that you follow for, to solve certain problems or advisors to invite into your life. Again, you just have to be a critical thinker when you're looking at other people's profiles and comparing yourself to them because you have to really try to figure out, well, how's this person making money? That's really the question you should ask yourself, right? When you look at my page, it doesn't scream, she's making money from beauty products because <laughs> that would be crazy. <laughs> I barely put on makeup to do this podcast, right? So that wouldn't make sense for me to then start showing you guys my beauty routine. So one thing that's really important is like when I go to your page – Consider it your highlight reel. Consider it your portfolio. So if you're applying to become a host for a Blavity show or you are wanting to pitch your food content for Home and Texture and I go to your page and it is not videos of you being a host or it's not videos of you cooking, then I'm like, what are we doing here? (laughs) And I move on to the next. So also be sure that as you're putting yourself in front of different opportunities, that your entire story makes sense. And I hear you, you're multi-hyphenate, you've got a lot of interest and things that blah, blah, blah. But what are the things that you're really trying to make money from? Again, you can put stuff in your stories, but if it goes on your feed, then it needs to tell the right signal to brands, partners, and your audience that you're communicating with. And I would also say something else for you guys to think about is you can't really do more than three things. So pick your primary and then you can do like one or two other things. And that can change over time. So let's say you started off as a travel influencer and all of a sudden you're like, I'm getting married or I'm having kids and I want to transition. Great. Now you can say I am a travel influencer and then you also share mom content and you share, you know, fashion right? But your primary is still travel, but now you're just incorporating some other pillars into your content. Um, That's okay, as long as it's consistent, just not sporadically showing us, you know, the fuel that you put in your car today. We don't care. We want to see mom content, travel content, (laughs) or food content. That's it. Um, So for me, as I transition into motherhood, I'm making a decision, and I haven't actually made this decision, if I'm going to start doing like mom content, I'm probably not going to do mom content. It'll probably just be me who also happens to be a mom, like me with the baby, you know? And when I became pregnant, I made that decision. I was like, "Mm, I don't think I'm really going to do maternity content. I think I'm just going to stick with a like, I'm still me, just pregnant. That was a choice that I made. I could have said, you know what? Moms is a huge category. There's a lot of working moms. Let me start to make a bunch of mom content. It is a part of my identity now, and I'm excited and grateful for that but it probably will not become my dominant content pillar. So let's talk about your secondary platform. So everything that I just talked about was really for your primary platform. Let's say that you also want to play on TikTok or LinkedIn if that's your secondary platform. Your secondary platforms can be more about a different niche. You can either make it consistent or you can make it different. So on my TikTok, I actually do take a more personal approach where I'm showing people a little bit more behind the scenes of my personal life, not as much. It's not curated. It's not 
as filtered. It's just like really random stuff. I don't care if it only gets 500 views. I'm kind of just like make a video, post it. And I find that the people who follow me on TikTok are really interesting because a lot of them don't have any historical context on me at all. And I've also noticed that the people who follow me on TikTok feel way more attached to me in a lot of ways than my LinkedIn my LinkedIn followers or my Instagram followers. People on TikTok will come up to me in like the airport and be like, hey, you're the black blabbity girl on TikTok. I'm like, wait, what? So it's really interesting to build different audiences on different platforms and build those different types of relationships. And so as I've gotten to know my TikTok followers, um, who honestly, shout out to y'all because y'all ride for me. Y'all come after these people in the comments who become a for me. So I shout out to my TikTok community. But I've been having a lot of fun just playing with TikTok and just keeping it light and not overthinking it. I don't talk about a lot of business stuff on TikTok. Uh, it's all from the lens of like me as a human, as a person. And I haven't done any brand deals on TikTok. It's not like all of a sudden I'm going to be, I don't know, selling you something on TikTok shop outside of more matcha, obviously. But other than that, I'm probably going to just keep it light and fun. So if you haven't been following my TikTok and you want to see the difference between my Instagram and TikTok, go ahead and head over there. It's just my first and last name. And you can get a sense of how I differentiate my brand on both. Okay, so let's talk about how to make money from corporate partnerships and brand partnerships on your social feeds. So Blavity works with hundreds of creators a year and pays them hundreds of thousands. We might even be over a million dollars plus probably, yeah, Kate's shaking her head. We're definitely over a million dollars in creator payments back into the Black community and to Black influencers and creators. And so we have a lot of experience pitching brands, Black creators, and also identifying and cataloging creators in our community that are brand safe and brandable. So here's some of my observations and tips for people who want brand partnerships. One, this is the number one thing. Your page has to be brand safe. When I say brand safe, what do I mean? I mean that your brand needs to have a consistent amount of content that you're posting regularly that is not violent, that is not controversial, and um, no death, no drugs, and not overly sexualized. No porn, no nudity, et cetera. And we can go into the rules of conservatism and progressivism of companies and all this different stuff, but that's not what I'm talking about. I just want you guys to know the facts. These are the facts. If your page talks a lot about guns, or violence, or has a lot of titties on it, we're not going to pick you to put you in front of these brands when we're building these decks, okay? So to each their own, but I would stay away from it if you want to make money. So that's the first thing. The second thing then is, do you have a core community and demographic that you're really talking to and that you've built trust and loyalty from? Now, you don't have to have 100,000 followers. We work with influencers starting at the 10,000 follower range, and then we go up to millions. Um, and I would say most people that we work with are typically in the 50 to 150,000 range, sometimes more than that, but oftentimes not. And the reason for that is that we find that um, those types of influencers and that size of influencer is really building a community or a group of people around them or a tribe around them that values their perspective. And they've clearly grown because People are following them. Their content is really good. There's a lot of creators that have 300 or 400,000 followers that just got them because of the algorithm back in the day or because they bought followers. And you can tell we use tools behind the scenes to actually track people's metrics and engagements. When we enter in your handle, it is public information for us to see what your engagement rates are. And we can tell when you've bought followers because you have 400,000 followers or 300,000 followers, but like 10 comments. Doesn't make any sense versus a micro influencer who might have 20,000 followers and hundreds of contents every time they post. So keep your content engaging. Comments, engagements are actual metrics that people on the back end can see and don't necessarily equate lots of followers with bigger brand deals because that's not necessarily the case. The third thing for you to think through is what category of brands and corporate partnerships do you want? 
And something that's really important to know that I think people don't think about in advance is what categories pay the most. People, hear me when I say this, automotive companies pay the most. Financial services companies, credit card companies, banks pay the most. Insurance companies pay the most. Uh, Tech companies, uh, tech brands with hardware pay the most. What do all these things have in common, my friends? They are all big ticket items, right? You're trying to sell a car. (laughs) So you need to spend, you have to spend a lot of money to sell this car to get you guys to consider this random car that you may or may not need. You know, if you are buying insurance for yourself, for your family, for yourself, or for your business, that is a signifier of a successful, you have something to protect, (laughs) right? You know, that's not a trivial uh, amount of revenue for that insurance company because you keep insurance, you pay it monthly, you pay it annually for years, right? So they're willing to spend for that customer. Same thing with banks. I mean, how many of us use the same bank our parents use? Not because we went out and decided, I'm going to become a customer of this bank or this bank. It's either convenience or because we literally already had a bank account there, right? And then you get your mortgage there, you get your loans there. So them acquiring a new customer or a new credit card customer is a significant amount of revenue for that business. Comparatively, if you're a beauty influencer and you teach people how to make dupes of luxury products for less, okay, so you're telling me that you're trying to get me to buy a $2.99 product. I'm sorry. There's not much advertising room there. (laughs) So be careful what category you put yourself in from the beginning because that can have an indication of the amount of money that you're going to make over time. Now, there's obviously people who are flukes. There's people who are outliers, the people who are extraordinary. Your Jack Hyenas, your Alex Earls. Yes, those people are amazing, but like again, they're outliers. I'm talking to the average content creator, average influencer, average person who's making 50 to 85,000 dollars a year from brand deals. Pick categories that are more lucrative. Travel is not a lucrative category. It's a good lifestyle. You get free tickets, you get free stays at hotels, you're getting free, you know, access to festivals, but they're not paying you cash. So be careful when you go into the travel category because you want to live a lifestyle versus build an income. Because what you'll see is that a lot of lifestyle creators have to then switch to credit cards and financial services because that's the category that actually pays. So hopefully that's helpful for you if you're in the early part of this journey. The other thing to think through is like if you're an influencer for businesses to other businesses, so a B2B influencer, like you're helping small business owners, you're helping investors, you're helping people in the business category, that's also a more lucrative category than consumers. Because again, think about the revenue that that company is going to make from acquiring a business that has a SaaS subscription. In other words, if you're promoting an accounting software, or you're promoting a payroll software, that company is making $100 a month every month for that entire lifespan of that business, which means it's really easy for them to recoup the cost of investing in an advertising or influencer campaign. So you got to always put yourself in the mind of the customer and the person that you're trying to make money from. So let me just break down how this works from the Blavity perspective, because I think it sometimes maybe is a misunderstood process of how brand deals even come about when a brand is reaching out to you. So here's the funnel. Big company, let's call it the white sheet company. Big company, white sheet company says, I'm going to spend a million dollars on the black community and black advertising and marketing this year. So then they go out to black advertising agencies or black publications like Blavity or Essence. And they say, I've got a million dollars to advertise the Black community over a 12-month period of time, please fill out this RFP. RFP stands for Request for Proposal. And they say, give us a plan at the $200,000 level, the $500,000 level, and the million dollars level. And in this plan, we want you to include five to 10 influencers. We want you to include a video, and we want to include some sort of event. So then my team 
sits together and they say, all right, what products do we have available for a white sheet company that's going to fit the category of person that they're looking to reach? They're looking to reach college students, people who are about to have kids, and typically women, black women. So we say, okay, great. We've got 2190. We've got Blabity U. We've got all these different products. And we're going to put it together. And then we have someone in-house who also says, all right, guys, here's 15 influencers who match that profile. They're soon to be moms or they've got kids going into college or these are college students on TikTok that have their big audience. And they send our internal team that list. And then that list our sales team or our integrated marketing team will look at it and say, all right, we like these five to seven. We're going to directionally put these five to seven into the pitch deck back to White Sheet Company so that they can get a sense of the kind of people that we think are best fit for this campaign. Okay. So then we fill out all these forms. We price out everything. We make a beautiful pitch deck and we send it back. Then the client will say, we love this. We love this direction. We want to narrow in on moms. We think you guys are better for moms. You're not going to get the full million. Can you build out this plan even further at the $500,000 level and then narrow in on moms? And we feel like we need more moms who have multiple kids. And we're like, all right, fine. So then our talent team will go back out, look around, think about people in our network, people we've worked with in the past, and scour the internet for people on TikTok and Instagram that match that profile. And then let's say we win the deal. We win the deal. And of course, we've negotiated ourselves down. So instead of $500,000, maybe it's down to $450,000, right? And half of that is immediately going to some giant video campaign that we're doing. So half of that immediately is gone. Let's call it $250,000. So now I have $200,000 left for influencers. And keyword, influencers, plural, <laughs> right? So let's say we're doing $200,000 for influencers and we're going to do um, 20 influencers at 10K a pop. Now, here is where people mess up. You got to realize we have to make a profit margin on those influencers still, right? I have to pay my team. I have to pay the salesperson who closed the deal. I have to pay the marketing person, the graphic designer, the talent person who pulled all the things. I got to pay taxes on this, right? So if it's $10,000 per influencer, we might be actually paying the influencer $7,000 and we're taking $3,000 off of the price that we gave the client. Now, the client knows this. They know that there's margins built into these products. So don't ever feel like, People are taking your money. They're not. This is all a transparent process. But then we reach out to these influencers. First of all, there's two ways. You might get an email that says, hey, we're doing this campaign. Are you interested? And that email actually comes before we've gotten the deal just because we want to make sure that you're interested and you're available. Now you say you're interested, you're available. Great. The deal goes through. It's like, great. Hey, we got the deal. Would love for you to be a part of it. Our budget is $7,000. And more often than not, the influencer is doing what they should do. They say, okay, well, my rate for that is actually 15000 And we say, okay, we accept that that's your real rate. Unfortunately, we're going to have to move on to the next influencer. Maybe we try to negotiate a little bit, but at the end of the day, when someone tells us their price, especially if they're a black woman, I'm like, that's your price. So your price is your price. And we have to move on, right? So... One of my best pieces of advice for an influencer is to actually ask up front, hey, like, where do you have wiggle room? Can you perhaps get them, let's say they're asking for two posts or three posts or, um, you know, a lot of different assets. Can you keep the price the same, but maybe lower the amount of work that you're having to do? Because it's very possible that there's no more budget left at that point in the game because it's now gone through six iterations, finance approvals, legals approval, all types of stuff. And at the end of the day, you're at the bottom of the funnel, which I get it, not a great place to be, but that's the reality of how this business works when you're working through brands and agencies and big corporations. So just something to think about. Instead of trying to increase your price, which you should always try, but seek to understand where you are in this process, what budget is left, and also, if you feel like they're asking for too much, 
it's going to be easier to get them to reduce the amount that they're asking for than it is to get them to increase their price. Advice you may not want to hear. Just keeping it real. (laughs) How I record these solo episodes, if you don't know, is actually I sit on them with my chief of staff and we have a conversation. So if it ever feels disjointed, it's because we're usually talking about something. But Kate just brought up a really good point, which is this is what happens when you work with a brand with integrity. Now, there, of course, are terrible actors in the creator economy, in the creator space that are going to bleed each creator down to their last possible cent in dollar. And they're going to take all the margin for themselves. You got to know who you're working with right? You got to understand and respect the values and the brands that you're working with. If it's a random agency just emailing you on Instagram or in your email, they probably are going to take as much margin as possible, upwards of 50% margin on your deal. If you're a brand like Blavity, where we want to work with influencers over and over and over again, and I have to see your face and our team knows who you are, and you're coming to AfroTech or you're at, you know, 2190 events or whatever, then yeah, we're going to do right by you because that's just how we operate, right? And we want to have long-term relationships with people and we want to make sure that the content's really good and everybody feels good about it. So um, that is a really important thing. It's just to keep in mind when you're working with these brands or these agencies, what kind of long-term relationship you might be able to have with them and get to know the people who are making the decisions and make sure that they're people who share the same values that you have. My last tip for someone who wants to make money with corporations is actually go into that corporation or that brand page that you want to work with. Look at the people who've tagged that in their tagged uh, pictures and look at the hashtags that they're using. Like, let's say it's a credit card company. So you might put credit card company ambassador, right? You might look at that hashtag or partnered with credit card company, insert credit card company. And then you can see the kind of brand campaigns that they're doing and influencer campaigns and get a sense of the type of person that they're hiring or they're working with, the type of content that they're having that person make. It's really helpful. It has been helpful for me when I'm trying to think through, do I want to be a mom influencer or baby influencer? I like go to the pages of, you know, Graco Baby or Duna, and I look at the tags and who they're paying to make content. And I'm like, okay, do I want to like do the same kind of content she's making? Yes or no? If it's not a heck yes, then it's a no for me, right? Um, Versus if I go to a page for a computer company or like a software company, I'm like, oh yeah, this is cool. Like I would love to test the software and then teach people how to use it. Or like, I would love to teach people or talk about this video game, or I would love to uh, even like design, you know, I would love to talk about buying your first piece of art, you know? So go ahead and look and try to do some of your own detective work to figure out what they're naturally paying for. So that's all for this episode. I hope it was helpful for you. If you did find it helpful, please leave me a rating and subscribe to the podcast. I'm noticing that a lot of people are listening to the podcast week over week, but haven't subscribed, which sounds like it doesn't matter, but it actually really does matter because of how the podcast algorithms work. You guys know I do this for fun. I do this as a labor of love, Um, but I am still a CEO and I'm very competitive. So please subscribe officially if you have been enjoying this podcast and if you've listened more than one episode. I love you. I appreciate you and have an amazing day.